Hi, this is Phoenix, and I'm going to discuss what could be called the teleology of mental illness. I'm using the word teleology or telos in its traditional form, so essentially uh, referring to something that has a final, final uh, purpose and a final reason for existing. So in other words, I'm saying that mental illness does have a purpose and it does have utility, and the trick is figuring out what that is. So, um, for me, the teleology of mental illness that I'm going to be referring to would basically be the claim that I believe that mental illness allows us, or the teleology of the mind is the ability to maximize the mind and maximize the ability, the abilities of the mind. And so essentially that's the claim. Um, I want to say that mental illness can be, be used as a tool in order to, um, essentially, uh, lead to some kind of utility or lead to some kind of purpose and uh, that mental illness isn't just um, a burden uh, or um, a burden on society or a burden on the purpose, but that mental illness can actually potentially be used as a tool to further society, to further the goals of an individual and the like. Now, how, how am I doing this? Well, um, well, that's a valid question. I would say that I would start off with the claim of mental torment. Now, I'm defining mental torment as the mental pain and the psychological pain that is associated with mental illness. So, for instance, a common example would be depression. So, when you're depressed, you feel like your life is meaningless, you feel like there's no point in existing, uh, sometimes it's difficult to get out of bed, and so essentially I'm saying that that is mental torment and that is mental pain. It can be the same thing with intense emotions. Uh, such as anger or sorrow or um, despair, um, which is a little bit diff a little bit different from depression, but still along the same lines of mental torment, um, or neurotic thoughts that we have, neurotic obsessions, things that we can't get um, we can't get out of our minds. Um, another good example would be just simple internalizations. So when we stereotype ourselves, when we belittle ourselves mentally, when we talk down to ourselves, um, I think that all of that is what could be called mental torment. And my claim is going to be that all of these things, uh, broadly speaking, are mental torment, but they lead to um, a more refined mind and a more refined person. So um, it's a cliche, but if you think about a person who never suffered, who never had any problems in their life, um, it would be hard to see that person as having um, flavor or having spice, so to speak. So um, a good example of this would be... Um, Cornell West Point when he talks about Baudrillard's um, hyperreality, and he says, and basically um, Cornell West criticizes Baudrillard's claim of hyperreality because he says that it's a claim for the middle class, um, people that have a lot of comforts and luxuries, and that it's not a claim for people that are actually in reality. So Cornell West specifically uses the claim of um, African Americans as having to live in reality because they have to survive and because they have to confront reality as it is while the middle class and people of privilege don't have to do that. And so they live in a hyper-reality. And so the reason why I'm bringing that up is because it would seem to me that people that have to face reality, such as people of African Americans uh, who are suffering, or in my case, people with a mental illness and people that have mental torment, they have to face reality. They have to confront reality as it is. They can't live in this um, bourgeoisie um, hyper-reality, metaphorically speaking. They have to live in a reality that they have to confront and the mental torment essentially helps them refine uh, their, their um, abilities as a human being, their abilities to empathize, their abilities to think. And I think that that's important. So while a lot of people would say that the goal of modern uh, psychiatry and modern medicine should be to eliminate suffering, I think when it comes to the mind, this is definitely still a valid goal. But I think that this goal gets exaggerated in modern medicine and psychiatry. And we forget that sometimes mental suffering, uh, if um, controlled enough, can actually become very useful for a person. Um, and without going too much into detail, I'm just saying I'm speaking from personal experience. I'm not overgeneralizing and talking about everybody, but from my experience, I could say that the mental suffering that I've experienced has allowed me to refine myself and become a stronger person as a consequence and become someone who can um, uh, face reality and not be stuck in this uh, boring Baudrillardian, uh, or Bo yeah, I think, that, I think that makes sense, Baudrillardian, um, hyper-reality, um, to use Baudrillard's term. And so, um, yeah, so there's that. And so basically I'm saying that mental torment isn't useless. 
Um, and then, in fact, we shouldn't always strive to eliminate and alleviate mental torment because it can serve a useful function. Now, um, the thing is we must be able to uh, work to cultivate these mental capacities. Um, and I think that that's the trick, and that's what we don't realize. Um, and that's because of our stereotypes about mental illness. So we tend to think, um, a lot of people tend to think that mental illness is useless, that it doesn't have a purpose, that it doesn't serve a function. Um, and we don't realize that there's inborn capacities of people with mental illnesses uh, that can uh, flourish and that can actually become useful. And the trick is to try to convince these people or to let these people themselves realize that if they cultivate those um, capacities, then there's more that they can do. Essentially, if they cultivate certain traits of their mental illness, which I will go into um, in more detail in a minute, then they will be able to essentially live reality more fully um, and um, achieve more. And um, essentially, to go back to my claim, they will be able to maximize the power of their mind. And I think that that's crucial and important. I think that that's super important. So, um, so more uh, practically speak. So practically speaking, how could this be useful? Um, and how am I even talking about um, strengthening capacities of the mind and talking about um, certain traits that could be useful? Well, there's a lot of examples, but I'm gonna I'm gonna only focus on three uh, because these are the most powerful examples um, that I have been able to. Um, uh, understand and uh, argue for. And so there would be the, um, the trait of depression. So if you have depression, um, there's a likelihood that you're going to be a much more sensitive person. So if you have um, more minor feelings of sorrow, more minor feelings of melancholy, and they're not full-blown depression, then this can actually be useful because you're more sensitive to other people and more sensitive to other causes and to things in existence and you don't become numb to it, but you actually become sensitive to it and you're more, you can become more empathetic and caring as a result. Um, in terms of mania, that can be useful for straightforward productivity. So there's people that I've talked to that are like manic all the time, but they get a lot done. They get a ton done and um, they enjoy life and they live life to the fullest and that's while they're manic, um, which I think is extremely powerful to keep in mind. The final one would be delusions. And as I've always said, and always try to imply um, delusions can be useful for a novel thinking, for thinking new, um, for, for thinking in a novel way and having new ideas. And I think that that's important. Now, um, so what I want to basically make clear is that um, even though uh, they would say, according to evolutionary psychology, that these, uh, these traits exist um, in minor forms because um, they help society and they help people progress, um, I think that's important, but what I'm saying is a little bit more radical than that. What I'm saying is that people that do have full-blown depression, people that do have full-blown mania, people that do have full-blown psychosis and delusional thinking, what they need to do is they need to tap into that and might have to do that with some medication. They might have to do that with some um, psychotherapy. They might have to do that with uh, um, alternative medicines um, and alternative treatments, but I think that it's possible that if a person with a mental illness works to cultivate those traits that they have with their mental illness, then um, there's no telling what they can do um, with their mania, with their full-blown depression, with their full-blown um, delusional thinking. And that's uh, the heart of what I'm trying to get at, which is that when somebody asks me how can a person make a mental illness useful, well, there's, there's already the hardware, there's already the, mechanic, the mechanical um, structures uh, for this kind of um, cultivation. We just need to be able to um, psychologically um, focus on our minds uh, and study our minds psychologically so that way we can work to cultivate these traits and cultivate what is already inborn and what is already natural. And I think that that's super important to keep in mind. Um, and so uh, now there's some problems with this. Some people would ask, why would we want this? Well, um, I'm going to be a little blunt here. This is a little biased, but this has been my personal experience and I think that there's some truth to it. Um, I think that society is run by the masses. In fact, there's a lot of people that would say that. And so society becomes complacent, it becomes milk toast, and essentially it becomes boring and bland. And so what we need are radical thinkers. Um, and this is, this, uh, is true um, all the way from ancient Greece. We've always needed radical thinkers to, um, to push the boundaries of society. Um, and I think that that's why we, we need radical thinkers. Um, we need intelligence, we need intelligent minds, and we need outlier minds. 
Um, we need radicals because otherwise the world would never change because the world would have no reason to change. Essentially, without radical thinkers, the world would become very complacent and um, that would be very difficult to, um, that would be a very difficult world to live in because then there would be no such thing as progress. Um, the, the moral and ethical dilemma of this and ethical dimension of this is that people that do have these outlier minds tend to be marginalized, they tend to be um, suppressed, they tend to be repressed, they tend to be um, talked down to, they tend to be condescended. And all of that is what I'm challenging. And so even people that uh, kind of uh, did have decent lives were still, um, that had great minds were still uh, very marginalized in a certain way, or they at least had their own mental struggles. And, um, but we need those great minds in order to, um, in order to challenge society. Um, and so, and I'm sure you can think of plenty of examples of, of great minds um, in the history of thought and in the history of intellectual studies and intellectual history um, who have challenged the course of society by being so radical in their thinking and being so determined to think about things in a different way. And so, again, the ethical dimension is certainly this idea that those people are going to suffer because they're not going to be welcome in society, but that doesn't matter because their ideas are going to persist. Um, and, uh, and that's what matters because it's going to make an impact and that's what's important. And that is essentially the teleology of the mind and more specifically the teleology of mental illness because um, a lot of people that made uh, a lot of really valuable contributions to the world uh, because they had such a radical mind did have a mental illness, you know. Um, and so uh, I said I wasn't going to mention anything, but I'll mention a couple. So Einstein theoretically had uh, autism, which is interesting. Um, Poe had severe, Edgar Allan Poe had severe melancholy. Um, and there's, there's plenty of other, there's plenty other, plenty other of, um, plenty other examples. And, um, that's what we need to keep in mind. And they had mental illness, but it was amazing what they were able to accomplish. And, um, it was because they, they weren't willing to, um, settle for less and settle for the status quo. And that to me is the ultimate telos of mental illness, or at least one of the most, one of the most important elements, because who is who is considered more of an outlier than a person with a mental illness? Well, certainly a person with a mental illness in many ways because they have um, they have radical ways of behaving, because they have radical ways of thinking, and because they essentially are in an inhospitable world who doesn't appreciate what they have to offer. So um, you might think that there is a problem with this idea of utility of mental illness, and that would make sense. Um, you might have your own reasons for thinking that. One reason is obviously indeed the fact that um, this is a very subversive claim. So a lot of people would say that mental illness is useless. However, I don't subscribe to that notion because I think that no mind is useless and I think that every mind has a uniqueness that needs to be appreciated. And so again, just to wrap this up, um, I'm advocating for this idea of the teleology of mental illness and I'm saying that what we need to do is we need to maximize the power of the mind and we need to allow other people to maximize that power. Um, people with mental illness and the like um, in order to advance society. Um, again, this is Phoenix and thank you.